Welcome to another fourth branch interview. I'm Russell Dolag. We're here today with Associate Justice Dennis Yamase. Okay, uh, thank you for joining us today, uh, Judge. Um, first thing we usually do in these interviews is we just ask a little info of the interviewee to give themselves. Up. So, what's your story? <laughs> well, I uh, I'm I'm from Hawaii. Uh, graduated from the University of Hawaii. And while I was uh, in law school, during my second year, I did an internship with the uh, FSM Congress and the FSM Supreme Court. Um, and then uh, I found the work uh, so fascinating that uh, after I graduated, I came, I returned to the, to the area, to Pompeii, clerk for the court. And then I did some work in uh, Palau for a while. And then I've, I've spent practically my whole 20 plus year career in Micronesia, in Palau, the FSM, and uh, up in the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands in Saipan. So you've had a pretty <coughs> prolific career in uh, Micronesia. So being that, from, being that you're from Hawaii, how do you like living in Micronesia and Pompeii specifically? Uh, I really enjoy living in Pompeii because I think Pompeii is uh, it's like Hawaii maybe was a, lo a long time ago. Uh, Hawaii's really changed every time I come back. Uh, I really don't like dealing with the crowds, the traffic, the parking. So uh, living in Pompe is, is really great to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, what have been some of the highlights of your career? Well, you know, the biggest highlight is being uh, appointed as an FSM Supreme Court Associate Justice in uh, 2002, by far. Uh, that's the highlight of my career. And I, I, love, I love being in that position and working to try to improve the court and the judicial systems in the FSM. Um, I've also done um, a lot of codification work. So I've done numerous uh, codes, uh, the FSM, I redid uh, an addition of the FSM code, the CNMI code. Uh, I did Palau's first code. Um, I did a uh, Yap State's code, and I worked on a, uh, a draft Chuk State code, which they haven't enacted yet, but uh, it's out there. So. So you've been pretty active in fathering some of the current codes that we've been using yeah. in the region lately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's Amazing. Yeah. The, the other project I'm, I'm very happy with is the uh, FSM Legal Information System, which is a website which contains uh, the, national, uh, the national and state constitutions, codes, uh, court decisions, oh. rules, regulations, those kinds of uh, basic legal information. That's a great resource. What's the website called? Uh, it's the FSM Legal Information System. It's uh, fsmlaw.org. Right. Yeah, I would, I would encourage people to get on that website and, and just take a look at it. And I think it's been especially useful for students uh, who are studying abroad and those people abroad so they can uh, mm -hmm. access, access the laws, FSM laws. So what have been some of the most frustrating for you in terms of the legal profession in Micronesia? I think um, I think probably the biggest I don't know if you call it a frustration, but the biggest challenge probably now is to encourage young people like yourself to um, to take up a career in the law. Um, it's been a long time I think since we've had anybody from Ponpe go to a U.S. institution uh, and graduate with a law degree. Um, and uh, just we, we just need much more, uh, much greater numbers of well-trained uh, legal practitioners in the FSM. So um, we try to encourage uh, more people to get to law school and to uh, you know build up the uh, local expertise in this area. So I've heard that you're also teaching at COM. Is that true? Um, I, yeah, I, I was teaching at COM in the uh, trial counselor's okay. certificate program. Uh, that was in Chuk oh, okay. when I was teaching. Yeah. So as an educator, what can be done to improve education in the FSM? Uh, well, I think one, we need, um, we need to get the teachers certified 
and uh, and better trained. And I think I think there's an effort to do that, and I think some of that is happening now. Um, but uh, I think one another thing people need to understand how important education is to the growth and development of the nation. Because I think the more educated the populace is, the better uh, the democratic form of government is going to work. Um, so we just need to uh, step it up uh, in that regard. Um, what I've observed is that, you know, uh, sometimes teachers don't show up to school. Uh, they don't have the, you know, the enthusiasm or the desire to really be involved. And, you know, this goes also to parents. Parents have to be involved in their kids' education. And if the population gets a higher level of education, you see things change in all kinds of areas, in economic development, you know, private sector development, uh, in governmental development. It, it will just lead to uh, all kinds of improvements all across, all across the board. So education is just so important. And I don't think, uh, I don't think people understand that or have an appreciation of that. Do you think there's a, a small rise in the youth that are kind of like thinking education is more important in their lives? Yeah, I, I, th I think, you know, I think it's slowly, slowly yeah. growing. But I, I think it needs to be just, it a needs lot, to be a, a major lot, over overhaul. It needs much greater uh, emphasis. Um, you know, the, the situation with the schools in, in, in Chuk is just, uh, it's just in a sorry state. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, uh, uh, people need to understand how important education is to the development of the entire country, so. Well, moving away from education, um, do you think that our politicians and government are as transparent as they can be? Um, well, you know, the, the I think there's a lot more room for improvement as far as transparency of uh, not only the politicians, but, you know, throughout the government. government. Yeah, so, um, but, I, but I can tell you that uh, things have changed. I mean, I was the legislative council for the Congress around the fifth, sixth Congress, and, uh, you know, we didn't have much going on to improve transparency, but you know, since that time, I, I helped uh, Congress to develop their website. So I know that, you know, they try to post uh, public laws, their agendas, uh, their schedules, committee reports. So, you know, from, th there have been uh, significant improvements, I think, uh, to increase transparency in government. But, th but there's no doubt that more needs to be done, I think. All right, so you work for the judicial branch of the government. Can you please explain to the youth, our youth, the branch of government you work for, its function in the political process, and your role within the branch of government. Okay, yeah. Um, I think most people know, or most students uh, should know, that we, we have a three-branch system of government, and that's, that's almost at every level of government, national, state, and municipal. And the three uh, branches of government are the executive, which usually is the president or the governor, and, his, and their cabinets. And then uh, they're in charge of executing and implementing the laws. And we have uh, the legislative branch, which is the Congress or the state legislature or the uh, municipal councils. And they're in charge of making the laws. And then we have the branch that I work for, which is the judicial branch, which interprets the laws. So those uh, branches have uh, three uh, separate roles and responsibilities within the government. And there's a separation so that no one branch can consolidate power. Because when you have one branch consolidating power, then you have, you might have a dictatorship yeah. or some other form of government which is not uh, conducive to uh, democ democracy and uh, those things. What's the process of becoming a judge? I don't think there's any real set process, but uh, you know, I think uh, I think it's good for any judge to have a basic knowledge of the law and the and the court processes and procedures. And then I think um, you know, I think over the years. Uh, 
that people can uh, determine whether you're, uh, you know, you're a fair and objective type of decision maker, and uh, whether you're a good listener, and whether you give both uh, sides to an argument uh, an opportunity to uh, to share their positions, and then you make a reasoned and informed judgment. I think if you have those traits, then I think, you know, I think you could make a good judge. <laughs> Are non-EPISM citizens eligible for the Chief Justice position? Uh, there's, no, there's no legal impediment for a non-citizen to be the Chief Justice. Uh, in fact, the first Chief Justice, uh, Edward King, was a non-citizen, and he helped to establish the court. In those days, there were really uh, not too many uh, FSM citizens who were, who were uh, right. that qualified, so I think they had to go to an expat as the Chief Justice. Um, we just swore in, about three weeks ago, uh, our Chief Justice, uh, Martin Yinug, who is from YAP. That's right. Um, do you think a jury system would work in the FSM? Yeah, that, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, we have a small population, and the downside is uh, it adds costs. It's right. going to add administrative costs to, uh, to do jury trials. And uh, there's a problem in small communities of being able to empanel an objective uh, <laughs> jury because, you know, everybody's heard everything before. Yeah. And, uh, they've got all these, these uh, yeah, information <laughs> out there. Um, the Republic of Palau is uh, instituting a jury system. Oh. And they are uh, smaller than us, and so we are really uh, going to observe whether that system works in Palau, because uh, I think if it can work in Palau, I think, I think we could do it. Um, but uh, they, haven't, they haven't had any jury trials yet, okay. but they're, they're gearing up for the, for the first one. That's interesting. <coughs> uh, I want to see how that works out. <laughs> yeah, we're all, we're all really interested in that. <laughs> this is a big question. Um, how is the FSM justice system managing the deportees back to our country? Is the FSM justice system ever informed by the U.S. or any country when deportees are coming back into the FSM? And is the FSM justice system capable of monitoring or enforcing or revoking said deportees' privileges and bring them back, him or her back, to confinement, but this time in FSM? Um, the first part of your question, uh, to my knowledge, we are not being informed of any FSM citizens when they are being uh, deported from, say, the United States and being brought back to the FSM. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no formal system of telling us, giving us that information. So we, we don't know anything about the deportees. Wow. Um, That's kind of scary. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, uh, I can't confirm this, but I think several of the people who were deported have subsequently gotten into trouble with the law. Um, you know, I, I think we'd be uh, ready and willing to assist in uh, sort of the monitoring of, uh, of deportees coming back into the FSM, but, you know, we'd have to work within our own uh, court procedures and processes. So. Um, so we're just, we're just, uh, there's no line of communication right now. Why that is I know. that? I, I'm not sure. There, I'm, I'm sure there's some kind of uh, information being passed maybe to the executive branch. Like to on immigrations? Who, and yeah, on like who's being name. deported and, and why maybe. Mm. Mm. Makes sense. Um, does FSM have political parties, like U.S.'s Democratic Party and the GOP? Um, not that I'm aware of. Do you think I, something like that would work in the FSM or should <laughs> happen in the FSM? Do um, parties? Well, well, you know, the good thing about political parties is I think it um, it uh, allows uh, debate about issues, maybe more vigorous debate mm -hmm. about issues, and uh, I think it gives uh, it promotes a greater pool of. Uh, uh, people running for elected office, which, which may be good. Uh, right now, I think the FSM, 
the, the alignment of political uh, for, for in politics would be more in line with uh, state state mm -hmm. interests and state government no, and there's nothing wrong with that mm -hmm. <coughs> but the political parties I think would afford uh, some greater exchange of ideas and things. Yeah. Yeah. if you don't mind me asking what are your thoughts on the re-election of Manny Mori and Ali Kalix? <laughs> Well, that's, uh, you know, that's in the hands of the Congress and the people of the FSM. Okay. And, uh, we're, we're happy to work with whoever is in those key positions in government. Have you guys had a good relationship with that administration? Um, I would say so. Yeah. I would say so. Yeah. What, what aspirations do you have for the Supreme Court? Um, well, you know, as I said, we, we just swore in the Chief Justice, Martin Yeno, got a yap. And uh, we're going to undertake uh, several important projects for the court. Uh, one of them is to prepare a strategic plan for the court. And I don't think that's ever been done. But that process is very important for the court to have some focus uh, as to its you know, main objectives and priorities and things of that nature. So that process will hopefully take place this summer at some point. We're going to get... Um, I think some people to facilitate that process out of the University of Hawaii Law School and a judge from Hawaii. So right. we're working on that. The second major project that the court uh, is really interested in doing is to revamp its uh, hardware and software and uh, technical infrastructure capabilities so that we can get into stuff like e-filing and archiving, uh, video conferencing, uh, the, these things are being done uh, throughout the United States courts and even in some of the other Pacific courts. And because of our geographical configuration, those, those things really make sense for us. Um, but they will require pretty significant costs for hardware and software. And that's why we're going to put together a grant proposal and hopefully float it to uh, some of the other countries which we have diplomatic relations relationships with and uh, I, I hope somebody will help us with funding that project. Hmm? How does our justice system compare with those of neighboring North and South Pacific Islands? Um, I, I think our court is, is, uh, is a solid court and I think, um, I think we compare very favorably with, with the other Pacific courts. Uh, and, and in some respects I think we're we're even ahead of some of the Pacific courts. The um, legal information system, which I just talked to you about, I think we were the first small Pacific Island nation to even have a system like that. So um, uh, I, think, I think we're doing well. I think we're doing well. How has your perception of Micronesians as a culture and a political group evolved since your arrival to the islands? Well, when I first came in, uh, in the very early 80s, uh, the nation was just being born. Um, there were still transition issues. Well, we were transitioning from the uh, trust territory of the Pacific Islands into a, a sovereign, independent nation. So there were a lot of transition issues to be dealt with, a lot of fundamental laws that needed enacting. Um, uh, there were still some, uh, you know, uh, battles in uh, jurisdiction, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. I, th I think we've gotten past all of that. So now I think we're, we're uh, a stable, democratic, independent, sovereign nation. Uh, uh, we, just, you know, we just need to continue to improve and uh, get better at, at, at many things. But I, I think we're on, on solid ground and the foundation and the initial transition issues are pretty much over. Do you think culture plays a role in the courtroom? Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, culture and tradition have an important role in the, in the courts. Um, we're mandated by, the, uh, by a clause uh, in, the, uh, in Article 11, Section 11, and that's, you know, that, that clause uh, mandates us to render court decisions consistent with Micronesian custom and traditions and the social and geographical configuration of Micronesia. And in rendering a decision, our court must consult and apply sources of the Federated States of Micronesia. So I think th that constitutional provision was put in there specifically to 
uh, make sure that custom and tradition uh, forms a part of our uh, jurisprudence and the way we handle things in the court. So uh, it's, it's definitely an important aspect. Do you ever feel that culture trumps or overrules politics and law? Um, well, custom and tradition and culture, it, it's part of politics. <laughs> It's, it's an integral part of politics. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't view it as, uh, you know, uh, culture and tradition trumping okay. another aspect, uh, the Western aspect or whatever uh, other aspect. I think uh, the challenges that we face are to harmonize the systems, to uh, incorporate custom and tradition uh, into the work that we do, and not, not only the courts, but ev everybody should uh, try to do that, and to harmonize the systems, really. And, and I think it can be done. I mean, it, it, it will take a lot of hard work and some effort, but we shouldn't be into where custom and tradition is, uh, you know, um, being antagonistic to any of the other political systems, I think. Is culture and custom getting away in progress in the FSM? Um, well, uh, I, you know, like I said, I, I don't see it. I don't see it in that way. I think uh, I think we can still progress and still uh, retain culture and tradition. I think I think Yap does it pretty yeah. pretty well. Uh, I see that. So you know, it's a balancing act. A lot of times. Um, but again, I think I think you need to harmonize the systems and try to you know work it in. So it's not really something as polarizing as like we gotta progress and let go, or we gotta not progress and hold on. We gotta marry the two. I think so. I think I think if that's possible, that that that's how it should be done. You want to retain uh, a lot of aspects of culture and tradition, and yet still move forward in the in the ways that you want to move forward. Right. I mean, uh, if. If you want to do it in the old ways, then that's you know that's a political decision uh, uh, done by the people or rendered by the people. So, what are your thoughts on the legal limbo Micronesians face here in Hawaii? Yeah, I've been I've been hearing uh, a lot of uh, a lot of those stories and uh, been informed of the situation with uh, Micronesian eligibility for health care. Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, I'll tell you that on, on this trip on Monday, I'm going to visit the uh, family court and speak to the judges there about Micronesian issues. And then I will, uh, I've, I've also met with uh, University of Hawaii law school people. And um, I think, you know, with the law school meeting, I tried to, I, I'm trying to, uh, uh, get, you know, trying to promote, as I, as I told you earlier, uh, FSM citizens get, getting an uh, legal education. Because I think if we had, you know, a few FSM citizen attorneys who are practicing here in Hawaii, they could help that population much mm -hmm. better. Because, you know, of course, they speak the language. They understand. And, uh, yeah, they understand the culture and the cult. Custom, and, uh, but I, I think a lot of this stuff, you know, Hawaii is under an enormous amount of uh, financial stress, just like we are back home. But I think a lot of it is a misunderstanding. Uh, people of Hawaii uh, sometimes don't understand uh, Micronesian customs and why they do the th why they do things in the way they do them. And uh, so, you know, I'll try to share some some of what I know. Uh, with the judges of the family court and then I think it'll take some cooperation between us back home and the Micronesians here and the Hawaii people to uh, try to iron out some of those some of those uh, problems with uh, you know financial assistance and health care and education and things of like that which which, is, which uh, they face some problems with this is our last I think I'm gonna pose on this is from one of our viewers. Mm. Via Mike Sem, MJ and Sire poses scenario. Suppose there's an election for either the FSM Congress or state legislature, and a candidate files a case against his or her opponent citing fraud, cheating, or bribery in the campaign. 
The opponent wins the election, but the case is awaiting trial. The credential committee of the legislative body has agreed to seat the person whose victory is being challenged in court. Can the court reverse the decision of the credential committee if found guilty? Uh, yeah, okay. Um, you know, we uh, sometimes we can't we can't uh, give a, uh, our opinion to a specific set of facts because those facts may arise in court and we may have to sit on a case of that nature. So we're usually prohibited from uh, speaking directly to those kinds of uh, scenarios. But I will tell you that there is a case uh, that was uh, taken up in 1994 uh, an appellate case, and that case is Atten versus National Election Commissioner, 6 FSM Interim 74. And that, uh, if you go to the FSM LIS website, you can access that, that case. And I would uh, recommend that the person who, uh, who asked this question to go onto the website and, and read that case, because I think it answers the question that, that he just posed. <laughs> okay. So uh, that's what that's what I would recommend recommend to you. But I think that's a good question, and uh, I think you'll get your answer by reading that right, appellate well, case. Thank you for that honest answer. <laughs> 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 we can't comment on that. But uh, anything else you'd like to add? That was our last. Uh, no, I well, you know, I just wanted to thank the fourth branch for uh, giving me an opportunity to be interviewed and to share some of my thoughts on uh, things. And I think. Um, you know, th this is the kind of stuff that I think needs to be done. Uh, the fourth branch provides a forum where you inform the people who, uh, who see uh, the interview or read the transcript of the interview. And it, and it also uh, generates discussion, uh, debate, you know, exchange of ideas. And that's, that's very, very important. And I think, uh, you know, the more we do this kind of stuff, uh, the better the uh, government will work and uh, every, everything will get, get better. So I, I really congratulate the fourth branch and, uh, and really hope you guys continue to, to, oh, do, to really do the things you're doing. Yeah. Really it's great. We appreciate your regards. It means a lot to us. Yeah. Well, once again, thank you for the opportunity to interview you and answering these questions. And I want to personally thank you for all the hard work you've been doing in FSM. Once again, this is another fourth branch interview. For more info, please check the link provided below. Please subscribe, check us out on Facebook and Twitter. And lastly, we just want to send a shout out to our graduates, University of Masa and Bilang Doyak. Congrats.